Good afternoon. My name's Thomas Doten. I teach here at Holy Cross College, and um, I have the pleasure of introducing Peter Dreyer. As more folks are coming for this panel, I think everyone else in the course of the day has been presented. How do you feel? What? Okay, I'll say that, you know, Peter has been involved in urban policy as a scholar, governmental official, reporter, and advocate for over 30 years. I find that amazing. We're exactly the same age, I think like 30 days apart. But in any event, he writes widely on American politics and public policy, specializing in urban policies, in urban politics, housing, community development, and community organizing. He's obviously... Um, a frequent speaker on these topics. He is the co-author of three texts about cities and urban planning, um, including The Next Los Angeles, The Struggle for a Livable City. And he's engaged in various civic and political efforts at the national and local level. Um, Peter joined the Occidental faculty where he's the EB, I mean EP Clapp Distinguished Professor of Politics in 1993, after serving nine years, is it, as director of housing at the Boston Redevelopment Authority and senior policy advisor to Boston Mayor Ray Flynn. And um, there's a long list of publications I'm not going to go through. I think many of us here are very familiar um, with Peter's work and will understand uh, why Place Matters, for example, uh, Metropolitics for the 21st Century uh, from 2001 did win the Michael Harrington Book Award. So I think that, you know, with, without wasting any more time, I would just introduce Peter directly. Thank Thanks. I want to start off with a personal story. I was uh, 14 when I first met Michael Harrington. He came to speak to my temple in New Jersey. Uh, the year after he wrote The Other America. And he was on the lecture circuit talking to churches and synagogues and unions and college campuses and maybe even some high schools. So we had a reform temple. The reform temple was supportive of social justice movements. Our rabbi was pretty liberal. Um, and he invited Mike to come and speak. Um, and my parents, who were New Deal Democrats, asked me to if I wanted to come with them, and I'd been involved in some work with them on the civil rights issues in my hometown. So I said I would go, and I was mesmerized, as were millions of other people around the world over the next 30 years. He was only about 33 or four years old at the time, and he talked about poverty and injustice in ways that made it just seem like common sense that this was an outrage and that there was something America could do about it. And uh, he didn't mention that he was a socialist. Uh, and after he talked, I, uh, I bought the book, The Other America. Here it is, tiny book, easy to read. And uh, I spent um, more than a couple hours, Alan, I probably spent a couple days reading it. And uh, I, um, I took it to heart. And uh, later I learned he was a socialist. And uh, it dawned on me that if he's a socialist, I must be a socialist, because I agree with everything he says. Um, and at the time, it's important to realize what we're going to talk about on this panel is the relevance of Mike's ideas today or, um, or what uh, Morris said earlier in his talk whether we're, you know, we're all going to kind of chat, channel Mike a little bit. So that's what I'm going to do as well. It's important to realize that when Mike wrote um, The Other America, 1962, he wrote it before that, when it was published in 1962, um, the civil rights movement had been underway for a while. But it had changed dramatically in the previous two years. The Martin Luther King and the Montgomery bus boycott, Rosa Parks, that was in 1955. Between 55 and 56, when the bus boycott was settled, in 1960, there was civil rights activity going on, but it wasn't very prominent until February 1st, 1960, when the students at uh, North Carolina A&T organized the first sit-in, uh, 
at a Woolworth lunch counter. And um, that spread very quickly throughout the South and uh, encouraged lots of students in the North to participate by boycotting, organized boycotts and pickets at Woolworths all over the country. And then the next year, uh, 1961, was the beginning of the Freedom Rides. And I think it's fair to say that although Mike's book was extremely well written and urgent and passionate, that the book wouldn't have been interesting to most people if there hadn't been a civil rights movement in the background making people alert to the reality of racism and poverty. It wasn't just that Mike had brilliant ideas and was a great writer. He was an activist, and he was living in a period of time of great social upheaval, when Americans were beginning to think differently about race and poverty, not simply because they were um, being hit with new ideas, but because you could not read an American newspaper in America in 1960 or 61 or 62 on almost any day without there being something about the civil rights movement protesting somewhere in the country, particularly in the South. Um, and it, it, on television as well, though less true then uh, as there would be a few years later, it was just an enormous reality in America. Plus we had a young president, John Kennedy, who was worried that uh, the protests in America, the civil rights movement, would make America look bad in the eyes of people around the world in this contest between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And so he was forced as president uh, to think about poverty. He might have been taken by Mike's book or the review of Mike's book from The New Yorker that uh, it's unclear whether he read the book or whether he read the review, but um, it's, it might, he might have been taken by seeing poor people in West Virginia during the 1960 campaign, but it was the civil rights movement that changed the agenda. And the post-war prosperity of the middle class rising uh, in America, due the, in part due to the labor movement, in part due to the highway program, the education program, government spending after World War II, that made it possible for people to think, oh yeah, America's getting more prosperous, my, my family's getting better off, we can afford refrigerators, we can afford cars, we can uh, take vacations, we can uh, stay in something called a motel, um, that Americans were beginning to feel uh, optimistic about their country. And so yes, solving poverty is something we might be able to do, and it's something that's in the common good. Um, and that was a spirit of the time that had to do partly with the prosperity and partly to do with this insistence by the civil rights movement that something had to be done. And that began to change in the 1970s, uh, and particularly in the 80s with Reagan and the attacks on government, the attacks on social welfare, and the beginning of the decline of the working and middle classes that thought, well, you know, if, if my uh, income's going down and my kids can't afford, to, can't afford to send my kids to college anymore and uh, we can't take a vacation any, anymore, maybe helping the poor isn't such a great idea. And so the, 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 and the, the movements for social justice began to fade during that period, at least the, the movements in the streets. And so I think all of those things contributed to a decline in interest in, in poverty uh, on the government level and intellectually. And I think today um, we're seeing the possibility of a new way of looking at poverty and a new concern about poverty. And this, I'm, I'm much more optimistic than I think all the other speakers have had uh, been so far today. And uh, if you think about uh, in the 1990s, uh, Clinton got welfare reform passed, and it forced people off of welfare. Um, it forced people to go to work, um, but there weren't enough jobs to go to work in, in, for a few years after uh, welfare reform was passed. Um, but it had one, po so I'm not a big fan of welfare reform, but it had one positive impact, um, and that it changed the way Americans view the poor. Uh, now when we think of the poor in America, we think of the working poor, not the welfare poor. And if you look at public opinion polls for the last decade or so, the overwhelming majority of Americans believe that if you work full time in America, you should not be poor. That the minimum wage should be high enough to lift people out of poverty. And that is a, Republicans agree with that as well, not as many, but Republicans, a majority of Republicans uh, agree with that statement, as well as the vast majority of Democrats. And young people in particular agree with that. Um, and as a result of 
this changing image, I think we've also seen some positive things in the last decade and a half that are often below the radar screen politically when analysts talk about what's happening in America. One is beginning in 1994 in Baltimore, Maryland, where they had the first living wage law, which basically said if the government's subsidizing your job with or your company with a, a contract, people should not be uh, subsidized to live below the poverty line. And it began in Baltimore in 1994, the first city living wage law. And now there are over 200 cities, including Boston, I don't know if Worcester has one, um, that have living wage laws. Now, they're not that big. They don't affect that many people, but they do affect millions of people. Um, and that's a, and that, it's also had the impulse of getting states to increase their minimum wage above the federal minimum wage. And so there has been this movement that ACORN and unions and faith groups have been promoting for the last 15 years to raise the floor. Uh, and it's, it's one of the most successful movements of the last 15 years, and people act like it's hardly happened. Um, secondly, there, is, there have been incredible campaigns, successful union campaigns over the last 15 years to organize the, the, most, um, the, the most poor people in America, including janitors. The Justice for Janitors campaign has been extremely successful that SEIU has organized over the last 15 years to raise the wages and working conditions and health care benefits of mostly immigrant low-wage workers uh, and often women workers. Um, thirdly, um, most Americans shop at and hate Walmart at the same time. <laughs> And Walmart has become, uh, thanks to Nelson Lichtenstein's book, um, a kind of metaphor for what's wrong with America. Um, and uh, we know, everybody knows, that Walmart pays you know, basically poverty wages, doesn't provide health care benefits. People shop there because they have to, because they have low uh, prices. But Walmart is, has become a symbol of what's wrong with our economy. And they're, the next phase of the labor movement, if it's going to be successful, they're going to have to figure out how to organize Walmart, which has so far been successful at resisting unions. And um, finally, um, on this low wage, uh, this working poor thing, the most popular book of the last 15 years that rivals the other America in any way is Barbara Ehrenreich's book, uh, Nickel and Dimed, about the working poor. I think in spirit and writing style, um, and, and Moral Impulse, uh, that book, which ha has, was a bestseller for uh, several years. And why did Americans buy this book about the working poor unless there was something happening in, in America's consciousness to bring about change? Um, I'm not going to go over what Mike uh, Kazin just said before, which are in my notes, about um, this growing uh, interest in, or at least the, the polls that show that young Americans in particular um, are kind of have a dead heat between socialism and capitalism. I, I don't know what to interpret that, uh, how to interpret that, except to say two things. One is, uh, again, as Mike said, I'll say it slightly differently, is that the attacks on Obama for being a socialist, I think, have backfired. And um, uh, people are saying, well, if he's a socialist, maybe it's not so bad being a socialist. Um, I've traveled all the way from LA with two props just to, just to point out that the, the right is crazy about this. Um, I, and and uh, here's a book called The Manchurian President, Barack Obama's Ties to Communists, Socialists, and Other Anti-American Extremists by Aaron Klein. And this book is, is very popular on the right-wing blogosphere. Um, and uh, Rush Limbaugh and Glenn Beck and people like that uh, have this guy on their show and talk about it a lot. And even, even more popular is this other completely nutcase book, which uh, I'm, in, I'm in the book. He says that I did, he said that I had an influence on Obama becoming an organizer. I, I, have no, I had no influence on Obama becoming an organizer. I never met, I've never met Barack Obama. He says, Obama must have heard me speak at some conference in New York and therefore became an organizer. I mean, it's crazy, but this is a book by Stanley Kurtz called Radical in Chief. Barack Obama and the Untold Story of American Socialism. Um, and I think the, the fact that socialism is in the news is partly because of these nuts. Um, but I do, think it's been, I do think that there's been the fact that Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh and Glenn Beck have been attacking Obama as a socialist for what are reasonably reasonable things um, has backfired. So now, Occupy Wall Street. 
Um, Occupy Wall Street could be, but may not be, the civil rights movement of this generation. Um, it has a lot of the same impulses as the sit-in movement that I talked about earlier. And um, the national news of uh, media basically ignored Occupy Wall Street for most of the first week or two. And then it began to pay attention to it. And this is, this is really simple. This is like brainless research. <laughs> um, so you all know what LexisNexis is. It's, it's newspaper stories, right? It's a database. So I simply looked at um, how often the word inequality appeared in the major US newspapers between October 2010 and October 2011. And you don't have to know the details, but what that shows is that for most of October, from October 2010 until September 2011, there were hardly any stories in American newspapers about inequality. And then Occupy Wall Street happens in September. And the next month, it uh, increases uh, by three times. Um, and it hasn't gone down since then. Um, I did the same thing with the word greed. <laughs> uh, and you can see that the word greed appears in three times as many stories in October than it had consistently for the previous year. And then just for the hell of it, I did the richest 1%. And you, do the, you see the same thing, right? So um, the Occupy Wall Street movement has forced the American media to pay attention to inequality and corporate greed uh, in ways that wouldn't have happened a year ago, a year and a half ago. This guy from Goldman Sachs who wrote the op-ed in the New York Times last week about how awful Goldman Sachs is. The fact that the Republican Party doesn't know what to do with Mitt Romney and how much money he made on, on destroying jobs with Bain Capital, and he's getting defensive, that wouldn't have happened without Occupy Wall Street. It's really changed the tone of American discourse, political discourse in the media. It's also changed um, our public opinion polls. And I don't know if I can read this uh, quickly, um, and then I'll get off. Um, um, hold on, I got to find this. Um, OK, um, in November of 2011, two months after Occupy started, uh, the Public Religion Research Institute found that 60% agreed of American people, agreed that our society would be better off if the distribution of wealth was more equal. A survey conducted by a psychologist at Duke and Harvard found that 92% of Americans preferred the wealth distribution of Sweden over that of the United States. Uh, and and uh, another Pew Research survey released in this last December found that most Americans, 77% of Americans, including a majority of Republicans, 53%, agree that there's too much power in the hands of a few rich people and corporations. 83% of people under 30 agree with that. 61% of Americans believe the economic system in this country unfavor, uh, unfairly favors the wealthy. And a significant majority believe that wealthy people don't pay their fair share of taxes. Now, in response to that, President Obama has been trying to channel the Occupy Wall Street movement without doing it uh, overtly. Uh, and he did it most, uh, most consciously in uh, his speech last December in Kansas, where he talked about the breathtaking greed that seems to be overcoming corporate America. And then he repeated some of those themes in his State of the Union address. Now, I'm not saying that Obama is going to run uh, for re-election, primarily on that theme. But it's clear that um, American public discourse has changed as a result of, uh, of Occupy Wall Street. So here's the dilemma that I'll end on. So what? <laughs> right? uh, well, how does that translate into anything? My view of this is that the Occupy Wall Street movement probably has as active members, or not even members, nobody can join, as people who occupied something uh, in the about 250 cities that, uh, 250 to 300 cities that had occupations, probably no more than 150,000 people, uh, some of whom were only there for a day or two. I know this is true in LA. And what they do over the next couple months will be of some interest to the media, and they are planning a series of actions for April and May. But what's more important is whether the labor movement, the women's movement, including what's happening with Planned Parenthood, the community organizing movement, um, 
the gay rights movement, the, the existing movements for social justice that have real organizations that aren't anarchistic like most of Occupy, how they try to take, or whether they try to take advantage of this new mood in the country to try to, in the elections, to help people get like Elizabeth Warren and others elected. And then after the elections, whether they can keep the heat on and keep this going. It'd be great if Occupy Wall Street continues. I'm a little worried about how some of the anarchists have taken over and uh, are gonna destroy the, the, the sense of solidarity within the movement. But I don't think what the Occupy people do over the next six months or year matters so much as how the movements that Mike worked so hard with uh, in the middle and end of his life to build a coalition, how they try to push the Democratic Party uh, to reflect this new mood. Um, and I think um, this is a, a possibility, but as several people said, it's not inevitable. My last comment is for those of you who are students in the room. Um, and I'll see if I can do this uh, quickly. Um, one of the uplifting things about the last 15 years has been the incredible emergence of activism on college campuses around, um, uh, around living wages for campus workers, around human rights issues, around now women's rights issues, uh, and particularly around anti-sweatshop issues. Um, and uh, during the break this, today, I went down to the bookstore and I looked to see whether Holy Cross College sells the Alta Gracia t-shirt, which is um, uh, a brand of t-shirt that's made in the Dominican Republic in a uh, non-sweatshop that uh, United Students Against Sweatshops, which is the national organization of student activists on this issue, have endorsed. My college does, and every time that they bring in a new batch, they sell out pretty quickly. Um, and so I would ask those of you who go to or teach at or work at Holy Cross, that one thing you can do to bring about more social justice is to convince fellow students and alums and the college to uh, make sure that in your bookstore you only sell t-shirts that don't exploit workers um, and that this Alta Gracia t-shirt is one way to do that. Um, there's about 300 colleges in the, camp, in the country that have that, that uh, sell Alta Gracia t-shirts and I think they, um, uh, they're selling very well. Um, so my final comment is this. Um, Mike Harrington changed my life in many ways. I named my daughter after him. How can you name your daughter after Michael Harrington? Her <laughs> name is Michaela. Um, and uh, he changed the lives of lots of people in America who never heard of him uh, and who will never hear of him. Um, I don't think we'll ever see anyone again like Michael Harrington but what Michael Harrington was more than an intellectual was he was an activist. And we will see a revival of progressive activism in this country. And if this conference can help remind people, um, not only as Dave O'Brien said, that ideas have consequences, but that um, you can change the world. And that uh, if I were speaking here at Holy Cross 100 years ago, and I said that we need a minimum wage, we need a progressive income tax, women should have the right to vote. We should end lynching of blacks as a regular way of, of, uh, of promoting uh, racial justice. We should um, give workers the right to unionize. We should promote um, the rights of people to, uh, of old people to have insurance so they don't uh, die in poverty. Um, and, uh, and we should have laws protecting the environment and consumers and workplace safety. You would have called me a radical communist utopian that had no idea what was going on in the world. And all of those things are now taken for granted in America. And that's because the radical ideas of one, of one generation are often the common sense of the next generation. And it's important for us to keep that in mind when things look bleak, that uh, American history is full of progress and it means that we can do it again. So thank you. <clears throat> okay. Now, my, my job as moderator um, is to invite the speakers from earlier today to either comment on what I said or more likely uh, channel Michael Harrington in, in their own way. Okay. So, Alan, you wanna go first? Mm -hmm. 
Um, oh, can we talk from here? Can you hear him? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, uh, thanks, Peter, but you, you mentioned some things at the end and said we take them for granted today. I'm afraid we don't. <laughs> um, Congressman Paul Ryan from Wisconsin has proposed a budget that the House of Representatives will vote for that would eliminate every single government program there is, period. Every one. Uh, uh, by the math of this program, if you're going to raise defense spending and you're going to make a big, huge tax cut, lowering the top tax rate to 25%, uh, for the wealthiest Americans. Uh, unless the economy would uh, grow at some level that uh, it's never grown at, um, every single domestic program of the 20th century would have to be eliminated. So I don't think those things are taken for granted at all. I, I think that uh, were Michael Harrington around today, um, the shift of the country so far to the right that one of our political parties has essentially decided that the entire New Deal needs to be repealed, would, under those circumstances, force him to become a defender of what we take for granted. I, I, I sort of think the socialist rhetoric would be completely downplayed because there's just a basic an attack. We only have two parties, and one of them is out to fundamentally break the social contract that we've been living under for 100 years. That, that's the overwhelming reality in American life today, it seems to me. Mark, you're pointing to me? Oh, um, well, channeling Michael Harrington. Uh, as I said earlier, M Mike was always interested in young people, uh, the oldest young socialist in America, and I think he would be delighted with Occupy being a movement started by young people. Uh, I first was very skeptical about Occupy until I saw a group of young people in Utica, New York, near where I teach, uh, who I'd never seen before, left-wing radical peace activities, uh, pull together uh, an occupation, uh, which was about usually a dozen to, to 20 people. Uh, but at their opening event, 400 people showed up, and 400 people never show up in Utica, maybe for a hockey game, but uh, you know, never for a, uh, that kind of political demonstration. And I thought, this is something new. And I think what they, it, Occupy was a brilliant act of political theater, just the way that the early sit-ins that uh, Peter alluded to were brilliant acts of political theater. They were intensely local, getting to a point I was trying to make uh, in my question to Mike, that is people everywhere around the country could participate at the local level. There was no national organization. You didn't have to join something, but you could not, nevertheless make a, a, a moral statement. You could put your body on the line, as we used to say in the 1960s. Uh, and they had a gift for um, political rhetoric. Uh, I don't know where that came from, but the 1% and the 99% is going to be with us for a long time, and it was a brilliant act of, of politics. The question is, uh, what next? And I think we, there is an anarchist component to Occupy uh, that Mike would not be um, happy with, but there's all kinds of people in Occupy, and there's, you know, Obama supporters and people who would never vote for uh, a bourgeois party. There are anarchists. Uh, if you go to YouTube, um, there was a brutal police attack on Zuccotti Park on Saturday night, and the young woman who was being beaten, you can get to this uh, on YouTube, uh, is a DSA member, a uh, 23-year-old graduate student at uh, the New School who's studying social movements, no less, um, and who has been involved with and in some ways a leader in, in the New York occupation since the beginning. So there's all kinds of possibilities there. and. Um, Time will tell. The, the sit-ins uh, in 1960 were completely uh, spontaneous. They spread just by word of mouth. Uh, and out of that spontaneous movement, which was a kind of an occupation, you'd go and occupy the lunch counter, uh, was founded the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, uh, which played a, a singularly important role in uh, civil rights victories in the years to come. So I, I although I have said some pessimistic things today. Occupy is uh, one of the things that makes me optimistic. Um, I'll, I'll follow on a couple of points that Morris made. Um, but I want to begin by saying I, I 
I feel a bit chastened um, sitting in a, probably the oldest, whitest, uh, straightest, <laughs> uh, malest uh, group to comment on Occupy. We don't look like Occupy. And I think, the, <laughs> uh, and I think that's um, in some ways a signal of the, the energy and vitality of a movement. Um, a number of my um, students at the University of Pennsylvania um, have been involved in Occupy Philadelphia, including the sorts of students I wouldn't have expected to see um, putting their bodies on the line even, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, and so um, that to me is, is a heartening development. Um, I do have concerns and worries about Occupy. Um, one of the major problems, and I'm sitting between two of the most important historians of the American left, but sure. one of the major problems that, uh, that the American left has faced um, uh, over the long 20th century and into the 21st um, is its inability to create enduring institutional forms, its tendency towards what I would call a sort of a Protestant inflected perfectionism um, that emphasizes individual uh, rather than um, solidaristic action, um, and um, its uh, uh, antipathy towards um, institutions and, dare I say, power. Uh, and one of the risks, I think, of the, of, of the Occupy movement is that, while it's, it's really quite amazing, and I, I noted the same thing without being empirical, that inequality, class, 1%, these sorts of things have moved to the center of the national political debate in ways unimaginable a few years ago. Um, on the other hand, I worry that um, uh, the absence of um, a commitment to more than process but, uh, and more than consciousness raising, but actual kind of institution building as a way of moving forward um, might hamper the long-term effectiveness. But Occupy is a young movement, uh, and no one looking into their um, cloudy or cracked crystal balls um, circa 1955 would have expected that the Mont Montgomery bus boycott would have um, sparked a, a significant grassroots social movement in the South, or that um, the um, sympathy protests with the southern sit-ins that happened in northern cities in 1960 um, and 1961 would eventually spur one of the more extraordinary, sometimes disruptive, often very creative uh, um, movements for um, uh, community transformation and social change in the North. So um, I, 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 uh, I think we, we ought to look hopefully um, forward, but also um, uh, try as much as we can to encourage Occupy to um, think long-term, think politics, and think power. Um, yeah, just to add a couple things. Um, certainly Michael would have said, this is great, now make sure you vote for Democrats in the fall. Absolutely. <laughs> um, because uh, one of the worst legacies of the new left, I think, and it's been carried by some of the Occupy people too, is to, is to say that, you know, uh, as the slogan goes, this is what democracy looks like. Well, democracy looks like that, and it looks like voting too. You know, you don't have to have one or the other. You know, there's a uh, Tom mentioned uh, the, the purism of some of the people in Occupy. But you know, one of the interesting things that Occupy has done, I think, um, and the civil rights movement uh, starting in the 50s did this too. That for a long time there has been a, uh, a dialogue uh, on the left. A lot of people, some of the people Jules mentioned before. Um, uh, labor justice people from faith communities and other places have been talking about these issues. If you read Rich Trumpkin's collected speeches uh, from the time he became head of the FSCIO until Occupy started, you would see a lot of the same things, a lot of the same themes that people in, um, in Occupy were talking about, but it wasn't getting attention. And all of a sudden, as Mars said, this quite brilliant um, tactic, which was borrowed in many ways uh, from what the Spanish indignados were doing in Madrid and in Barcelona, uh, and some ways also was inspired by what happened in Egypt. And this is something which is interesting too, the internationalization of, of protest uh, has always been there, as historians know, since the French Revolution, but it's really jumped forward tremendously in the last uh, couple of years. Um, you know, all, all this means that in some ways, uh, Occupy people were tapping um, a sentiment that was dormant, um, but uh, were able to give voice to it. And that's absolutely uh, essential. Um, but for better or worse, Occupy also became a brand. I don't mean that uh, pejoratively. Lots of things in America get branded, as we know. Uh, it's almost impossible for things not to get branded uh, in the kind of the cultural market system that we live in. But at the same time, that means that people you know, wanted to keep that brand going and growing. And so if you look at Occupy Wall Street website, which I do uh, regularly, uh, most of the um, discussion is about, you know, let's go back to the parks, about police brutality that takes place in the parks. Let's get back to what 
made our brand, you know, a brand. Uh, and that's a mistake, I think. Uh, and in fact, from what I understand, and a lot of people, the young people on, on staff at Descent, for example, um, are been very involved in Occupy and have written about it in various ways. Uh, they say that what's happened is a, at least ever since the winter, ever since the encampments got busted up, especially in the east and to some degree also in the west, is that it's, it's fragmented in very creative ways, I understand. People working on anti-foreclosure movements, some people have started working on a local basis, the Democratic Party, some people have, have uh, made the alliances, the embryonic alliances they made with labor earlier, uh, real or more concrete by working on union organizing drives. Um, and that to me is, is exactly what, what needs to happen. Um, I think Occupy Wall Street, like the sit-ins in some ways, was a tactic, and it has to be understood that it was a tactic, a brilliant tactic, but it was not a strategy, much less uh, the germ of a movement. Um, and if it's seen that way, then, then I think uh, it could begin to start a new um, chapter in the history uh, of the left. Um, but uh, you know, I'm afraid that the people who want to keep it a brand, who want to keep doing the kind of things that work so well in the fall, um, are going to make it, are going to, you know, lead to a lot of bad media coverage, let's face it. Uh, people who are going to, you know, get arrested, you know, as much as they can, who are going to make it seem as Obama's just as bad as Romney, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and, that, and that's a danger. But uh, in the end, you know, it was <laughs> the best thing that's happened, uh, you know, in American uh, politics since, God, I don't know when, uh, um, the height of feminism, I guess, and, and, and gay liberation back in the 70s. Um, yeah, just I'll tick off a few things. One is, uh, given 50 years ago today, this, this year we also had Michael's great uh, failure at uh, Port Huron. Huh? So listening, I guess, would be, <laughs> Michael, I think, would advise us to listen better than he did. It's so hard to hear you. I'm sorry. It's 50 years ago since the uh, famous event in Michael's life when the conflict uh, developed over the Port Huron statement of uh, SDS. And, so I think out of that, he apologized for it so often and would probably say the first response to Occupy and protest movements is to listen and to uh, uh, be sensitive and kind of keep your mouth shut for a while. Uh, the second thing, and certainly from Worcester we knew this, is that encouraging through your networks and contacts to have local people uh, go down and build a relationship with the people in the Occupy movement. I can say that in Worcester, if it hadn't been for some uh, community leaders who immediately made contact with them and let city, city officials know that they cared about what happened, they would have thrown them out right away and it would not have been a good scene. Uh, the third would be to encourage organizations. Certainly Michael would want organization in some program, but uh, to do that gently by building as, as much as you can kind of relationships with existing movements and with your network of supporters that would facilitate their making connections with people in the Occupy movement uh, and making themselves available to facilitate conversation and the kind of meetings that might enable organization to take place. And the most important thing I would say is, Peter mentioned all these things that have happened in recent years, like the sweatshops and other great things. And I visit a lot of campuses. I've been to all 28 Jesuit schools. And everywhere you go, you would get people saying, isn't that wonderful that the students are doing that? But nobody does anything. What I said today about church stuff is more generally true, I think, that it's not other people's organization, it's our own. And sympathetic people have no way and don't seem to want to take the initiative to find a way to be able to be supportive and to assist these movements when they develop. So there's sympathy, the polls may show support, but people basically don't do anything. Not blaming them, I'm saying that we ourselves have not taken the kind of initiative, creative initiative, to develop the kind of networks, connections, and so on that might enable people to respond supportively when that might be appropriate. The great example for me of that was in 2004 when these amazing young graduates of Catholic colleges tried through new media to make contacts across the country and provide some alternative to what the right wing was doing in that election cycle. They did some amazingly creative work and some that became really effective in 2006 in some of the swing states, but there was almost no financial or personal support, organized support from the wider liberal Catholic community. And I think that's not just, that's just a symbol of a larger problem that we're all expressing sympathy but sitting on our hands. We are not building the kind of connections and organizations that might enable us to be of assistance to these movements. Uh, can I just make one, one quick thing? Um, one of the things that was encouraging uh, to me and you know, gratifying too as a writer is, is uh, 
at least uh, in Zuccotti Park, I'm not sure if this is true elsewhere, or is it true in Utica or not, but, but uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion of books, actually. And, and famously, uh, uh, there was a big library that was built up at, uh, um, in Zuccotti Park, which, of course, the cops, when they broke it up, did away with all the books. And there was, uh, and you know, some people involved, uh, you don't have to agree with their point of view, David Gravener, um, Naomi Klein, and others, you know, they're book writers. Um, and, uh, and there was not, you know, sometimes on the left in recent years, there's been this separation between the activists and the, and the, and the intellectuals. And people sort of, you know, thought, oh, just, you know, stop talking so much. Go out and do stuff, you know. Actions are, are crucial. And of course, Occupy Wall Street was full of actions. Um, they were all about action. But at the same time, uh, they wanted to figure out what was going on. And so they were reading books like Winner Takes All Politics, wonderful book if you haven't read it, um, and, and uh, really trying to figure out whether the financial transactions tax made sense. I mean, that's not something that comes out of pure action. You, know? mm -hmm. uh, you have to uh, read uh, and, and discuss um, whether or not you're discussing going like this or this. But you know, nevertheless, you have to, you have to um, educate yourself. And one of the important, important things movements do uh, whether it's right-wing movements or left-wing movements, is they educate people. They give people a way to, to believe that what they learn is essential to understanding the world and to changing the world. But they have to learn in order to do that. Um, you know, Glenn Beck serves that role for some people on the right, and Michael Harrington served that role for, for some people on the left, and there are people today who serve that role for Occupy Wall Street too, whether agree with them or not. And that's, that, I think, is, shows that this is a, a movement which, you know, can endure. So uh, there's the mic. This is our, the last panel of the day. So if you have any pent up needs to talk, uh, or you have some uh, questions for anybody or comments, mic check on the panel. <laughs> anybody? I see somebody coming down. Okay. Emerging. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much for the panel. Um, Wait, what's your name? My name is Matan, I'm from Brandeis. Um, one of the things that, um, and I don't know to what extent this has to do directly with Occupy, um, but it definitely has to do with labor. Um, and I think this is hopefully one of the things that Occupy can, can also sort of bring out there is that um, one of the ways in which, the, in which corporations have been increasing their profits in particular ways without increasing um, anything, any benefits that, that workers get is by moving away from traditional kinds of labor. Um, because traditional labor does have at least, even if the rates decline, does have some ways, uh, some recourse of power. Um, so I'm thinking of the huge movement uh, to contract labor and subcontract labor, the huge movement of permanent temporary labor. Um, there was a, a, a very eye-opening um, article re uh, written recently um, on, uh, on Mother Jones that I, I think sort of got around um, about the, um, I think they're called third-party logistics companies that handle, um, if you order something online, somebody somewhere has to find where that is in a warehouse and put it on a conveyor belt somewhere. Um, and those people work as contractors for the place where they work, where even the, the online merchant that you buy from doesn't, may not even know where that place is. So the, the insulation from the consumer is at least three layers. Um, and yet it's cheap and easy to buy online. Uh, you know, have it in your house in two days. So from the, you know, waking up the consumers, it's almost impossible to do. Um, so I don't know if, 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 you, if any of you want to speak to how, you know, traditional labor organizing can have anything that, any response to this, um, or whether, you know, there, there needs to be more um, consciousness raising and consciousness raising on the part of, of uh, consumers. Mm -hmm. I, I think if um, Mike Harrington were writing a version of The Other America today, um, he would have a section reminiscent of the one I mentioned talking about the 
expanding service sector. Uh, he'd have a section on temps, uh, consultants, um, <laughs> uh, uh, contract workers, adjuncts, um, folks who are basically um, uh, have none of the security, um, insecure wages, and um, a you know, tenuous connection to the kinds of workplaces that you know, um, provide long-term good for, for people. Um, exactly how organized labor reaches into those worlds and, 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 uh, um, and whether organized labor is, is the right vehicle or suited or has a toolkit to do so, um, I'll leave that to my wise colleagues sitting around me. But um, raising the issues, putting it out there much more than it's been out there now, I think is indispensable. I don't, I don't have a solution to that one, but uh, one of the statistics worth paying attention to is just how much of the remaining 12% of uh, workers belonging to unions are public employees. Mm -hmm. uh, they're virtually the only ones who have been able to, they can't outsource their, their labor, but it, it feeds into the, the anti-labor uh, sentiment because these, these people are paid by the taxpayers and they have a better job than most people in private employment, and therefore they should be brought down to the level that everybody else is miserably occupying. So it's a very difficult and unfavorable um, moment for the labor movement. And I wish I had the solution. You know, the uh, statistics on, on unionization rates are pretty stark, right? Several of the other people already mentioned this. In the mid-50s, uh, around the time that Mike was writing The Other America, about a third of all the non-agricultural workforce was in unions, and today it's about 11 percent, and half of whom are in the public sector. And so business uses that as a way of saying unions are no longer needed, Americans don't like unions anymore, uh, they're not needed. Uh, they understand that you know we're not a factory uh, economy anymore, so we don't need to have a, an industrial workforce that's unionized. <laughs> Sorry, um, but the polls show just the opposite. About uh, 58 to 60 percent of workers who are not unionized in the United States uh, say they would like to have a, a union in their workplace. Um, but they're not crazy. They're not going to uh, participate in a union organizing campaign if uh, they think they're going to get fired, uh, which is what happens given American labor law. We, we have the weakest labor laws in the country in terms of the balance of power between workers and management. And so, um, you know, Americans are not crazy. They know that, you know, given the lack of voice they have on the job and the, and the act, um, insecurity people have at the workplace, people want or they know they need some kind of organization to protect them and to advance their interests, but uh, it's very difficult to do that. And so organizing is, I work with a lot of unions in LA and, and most of them have, in the last decade or so, have avoided using the current labor laws to try to win a majority victory in their workplaces. They, they do it using other forms of political pressure on, on, on uh, employers. So um, I think Americans, uh, you know, the labor movement has to figure out how to how to take advantage of that sentiment, and they haven't figured it out yet. And but there's a lot of very innovative thinking going on in the labor movement right now about how to do that, whether it will uh, bear fruit uh, quick enough before the labor movement gets down to six and seven percent. Um, that's that's one of those questions that we'll only know looking backwards. Uh, but there's a lot of ferment in the labor movement, and some of the most interesting. Uh, activists in community organizing and the women's movement and others have been moving into the labor movement trying to figure out how to take advantage or how to, well, how to deal with, particularly like what I said before, the Walmartization of society. The other fact I want to point out is that um, there's, you know, the fact that America has become more of a service economy means that uh, more and more of the jobs can't be exported. I mean, some can. You can have people answering phones in India. Right? But you can't move hospitals and you can't move utility companies and you can't move universities. Um, some capital is more mobile than others. And uh, given the fact that more and more of American business and capital and employers, including universities, are stuck in where they are, that makes organizing actually more likely to be effective if they can overcome these, the, the labor laws. And of course, everybody hoped that Barack Obama would and the Democrats in Congress would have revised the labor laws, but they, they didn't have the political either uh, 
uh, clout or they didn't have the political will to do that in the first four years of the Obama administration. But I think it might be a, an agenda for the second uh, four years of the Obama administration. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that was interesting about Occupy Wall Street is that uh, labor unions immediately supported, yeah. supported them. And it wasn't just because they liked what they were saying. As I said, it was Trumpka and other labor people were saying similar kinds of things before. It was also because, you know, a little disagreement with, with Peter, they felt they needed, they needed something like this because whatever some polls say, um, you know, it's pretty clear that, that it's easy to scare Americans away from labor unions, whether it's because of the, the power or whether because they're afraid of they won't get much. Even if they get the union, if they struggle and they get the union, and they won't get much anyway because the, <coughs> the plant will move if it can or, or they'll just fire union workers uh, without much penalty. Um, and, that's, and that's one of the reasons why um, I think something like Occupy, even if it doesn't it continue to exist with that term, is absolutely essential to labor because, uh, you know, it really was able to uh, get people to talk about these issues in a way that labor had not been able to do. Uh, and one, one little uh, piece of data on that, uh, I don't know if people know the Working America, uh, which is a group that is part of the FLCIO. It's run by a former labor organizer, former new leftist named Karen Nussbaum, uh, a friend too. Um, and she said, that um, in the in October, um, first two weeks of October, when, when Occupy really got you know tremendous media coverage everywhere, um, they uh, were able to sign up tens of thousands of new members of this group called Working America, which is part of the AFL-CIO, but, but you just have to pay dues. You're not you don't have to be a union member. Uh, it's for people who basically support labor and want to help us political causes, but are not in a union or. Uh, or in a union, but they want to help a little extra. And basically, they were able to go to houses in, in Indiana and in, and in uh, Texas and uh, parts of the West and say, hey, we're, we're with Working America. We support Occupy Wall Street. People say, oh, OK, I'll sign up. <laughs> so, so that itself was a sign that um, it was getting into, quote, middle America uh, in a way that, that labor's had a hard time uh, growing in, in recent years. OK, next speaker. I've been, a, I've been a union lawyer for over 50 years, uh, but at heart I am an organizer. Uh, and what I would, what I, my point is that obviously this is the 50th anniversary. There will be other Harrington, other America events, and it would be great if there was some central place that knew about these. So, for example, the American Prospect will have a special double issue, I think in May or June, on poverty, and it will have a conference in Washington around the same time on Harrington and poverty. And somebody has told me that there are a whole bunch of other events in other places, uh, and I think the momentum of this should be taken advantage of and so if there was some way to have a Harrington uh, Other America 50th anniversary website or some way to kind of coordinate this, it would be helpful. Now, whether DSA does that, uh, I'm not sure, but it does seem to me as a great opportunity to move things forward. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to ask, you talked in the name. beginning. What's that? Your name. Oh, I'm Bobby, Kylie student here, sophomore. And I was going to ask that in the beginning, you talked about how the uh, media kind of took several weeks to pick up on the Occupy movement. And I was just curious, um, in a lot of ways, the mainstream media that I saw in the movement kind of shed it in a very negative light in some aspects. Like, they talked a lot about you don't know what, they don't know what the goals of the movement are. I saw that again and again, and when I talk to people about that, they always mention that, yes, it's a great movement, but what's the goal? And a lot of the media I also saw covered always seem to talk about the day when the police came and pushed them out of the parks, and it kind of almost made it look like a dying movement when these articles were coming out. They're getting pushed out of here, they're getting pushed out of there. So other than um, kind of bringing, uh, shedding like light on the subject and letting people know that Occupy was happening. Do you think the media was, you know, helpful in Occupy or did it kind of 
bring about? Yeah, those are good questions. Well, here, my view is that the the media aren't pro or anti anything. They just they want drama and conflict. And um, the first week or so of Occupy, the you know I was a reporter for uh, a number of years, and uh, you know an editor sends a reporter out to this occupation, and they want to know how many people are there, and is there going to be violence? <laughs> right. That, that's the first question. Right. Is this a riot or is this like just a little demonstration? And who's sponsoring it? And what are they, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the first week or two of Occupy, it was who are these people? What do they want? They look a little weird, right? And uh, and they're not very well organized. And who's this guy in Canada that's their inspiration, right? And so they were, the the media was very cynical, and it was more about who the Occupy movement people were, and their personal characteristics than what their message was. But then they hung around. And then it spread to other cities. And that happened mostly through social media, not through the mainstream media. People heard about it through other ways. And I know that my students and my friends in the labor movement and community organizing groups, they started participating in the Occupy LA thing. And the mayor of Los Angeles and the city council of Los Angeles blessed them, uh, saying that this was something that we uh, approve of because the head of the County Federation of Labor, Maria Elena Dadasso, is a very powerful figure, and she endorsed Occupy, and so the city council members felt they had to say something nice about it. And so it got a certain more legitimacy as a few politicians uh, started talking about it positively. And I think a major turning point was when Senator Bernie Sanders, one of the socialists in Congress, <laughs> held a hearing uh, and uh, asked Ben Bernanke, the head of the Fed, to come and talk. And he asked Bernanke, what do you think about this Occupy movement? Do they have anything legitimate to say? And the head of the Fed said, yes, I think that their, legitimate, or their grievances are, are legitimate. He didn't say it as if he was about to go out and occupy himself. <laughs> but I, so I think what happened is all of a sudden the, me, the media began to take this more seriously and the message became more positive. And then after a couple months, the media got tired of it. And the only news they could focus on was the mayors are now kicking them out. And the, some, in some cities, not in LA, the police are getting a little violent. So that became the story. But as I said in my remarks, it sort of doesn't matter because a lot of Americans who don't like the Occupy movement aren't sympathetic to radicals or aren't sympathetic to protest or aren't sympathetic to civil disobedience are nevertheless sympathetic to the message of a widening gap between the rich and everybody else, the 1%, the 99%, people should pay their fair share of taxes if they're rich. That, that message resonates. And so you can hate the occupiers and love their message. And that's what I tried to say in my remarks about these poll numbers. It's pretty striking how many Americans agree with the message of Occupy. And the question is, politically, Will that translate in the election? Will the Democrats uh, try to channel some of those messages? Will the people in the labor movement and the citizens groups start register voters and, and get involved? And will the occupiers and their friends and family, uh, um, and this is a question for those of you in Massachusetts, you know, will they work on Elizabeth Warren's campaign or is she just another politician? And will that happen around the country? And, in Los Angeles, I know a lot of the Occupy activists are now involved in uh, fighting the banks over foreclosures and that kind of stuff. But in November or in the over the summer and after Labor Day, our job as activists is to try to persuade those people and their friends to work in political campaigns, as Mike Kazin said. And so that there's no if they can find that balance between inside and outside politics, between uh, getting involved in the Occupy movement at the same time and protest politics, at the same time elect a more progressive Democrat uh, majority in the, in the Senate and maybe in the House and, you know, lots of, a lot of swing districts. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no guarantee what will happen in November. I think that's, you know, the Occupy movement alone can't change the country, but it, it has created a mood that can change the country. That's a good place to stop. I want to thank uh, all of our speakers who have done a really exceptional job and very well prepared, and I'm really grateful for that.